So just for the curiosity's sake, I thought I'd just actually punch those two numbers in and guess what happens when I actually run it. Bloody works. Unbelievable. Their own sodding document is wrong. Guys, I'm going to see if I can try and bash out a really quick video because I've got so much to do at the moment. Um, I've got a little laser module which is in the end of this Dalek gun. I'm going to see if I can wire it up so I can fire it and also see if I can use a little sound module and play with gun sound effect and effectively fit that inside the gun. Obviously a laser module is quite dangerous to take out so I'll try and design it in such a way where I can replace the laser module with like an LED or something safe if I ever actually go outside. Because I'm trying to do this really quick, I'm trying to make it out of parts that I've got in my little stash and it turns out I've actually got bugger all. I thought I had way more parts than I do, so this is going to be a bit of a hack together piece. I might revise the design, do a proper PCB afterwards, maybe, if I can be bothered. So let's see if we can get something done in a day. So this laser module that I've got is what's called a Patobim laser. So rather than just being like a tiny little dot, it actually provides quite a wide beam. So this laser module runs at 3.5 to 5 volts. So I'm going to try and run it at 5 volts, but the sound module runs at 3.3 volts, so it might be a bit of a complication there. But firstly, let me just show you what this looks like. So, let's set the power supply up. So it's going to 5 volts. And we set the current limit. Supposedly it's 160 milliamps. So we set the current limit to 180. Gives a little bit of headroom, but if it fails, it should um, hopefully capture it. So. So these are laser goggles, they're only really cheap ones, but this is really low power. And because it's 100 milliwatts over such a big area, hopefully the intensity of the light's quite a bit lower. So I've gone for a 450 nanometers wavelength rather than like 405, so it looks more blue. But yeah, it's coming up quite purple on that camera. But yeah, it's drawing 112 milliamps, so hopefully it's in spec. This is the laser module itself. So it's got like a some sort of culminating lens to try and widen the beam on it. And it's got an outer diameter of 22 millimeters, which fits virtually perfectly into my tube for my gun. And also it's got a regulator inside it as well. So it's not literally just a um, laser diode. It actually has a current regulator in there and accepts a wide voltage range. That's kind of why I went for this. I should be able to turn this on and off just by effectively turning on and off the power to it. I don't have the current limit or anything like that. So I should be able to switch this on and off just by a simple MOSFET, hopefully. So if I could time turning on and off the MOSFET power in the laser diode with playing the audio for the gun effect, hopefully that'll look alright. The actual cable themselves, I think they put like a DC-DC converter or something like that on there. So it came with a um, funny little connector that I don't have any other of the other side for, so I'll just cut the end off and try this out, but I think I might try and put Molex 2.5 mil pitch KK headers on it. Actually, it's the housing, sorry, rather than the header. This is all the bloody KK connectors. I thought I had absolutely loads of them, but no bollocks all. So you probably can't see this. There is a microscopic little one written on this pin here. So when it goes vertically down on the board, that's pin one. We go for that pin there in the positive side. On this pin, you have three different prong sections. This bit here. I don't have the right crimp tool for this, I'm using like a really cheap version for it, but if you have the proper crimp tool, the crimp tool actually grips the connector by wedging a little piece in there, and then you can push your wire in this direction, it butts up against that back bit. This section in the middle crimps down on the wire, and then this section on the outside crimps on the insulation to give it strain relief. This is really thin wire, so I might fold it over itself, but we want to strip our wire so it's effectively twice the length of this little bit here. We don't want the wire protruding too far into the connector, and we also want to make sure we get the insulation gripped on with that bit. That's how it should sit in the connector. This is actually the first time I tried using this crimp tool. The deepest side is that side. So this side wants to be the side that the cable insulation comes out of. Poke your wire in. Crimp down on the insulation there. 
and then it's crimped down on the copper. You might just be able to see the copper sticking out a tiny bit. Two crimp wires. That wasn't that wasn't that hard. I've done this for years, so. So we said pin one was going to be red, pin one's that side, so of course I've crimped these around the wrong bloody direction. That goes in there. These are a bit funny actually. You push them in, they don't go all the way in. Tilt it downwards, and then it pushes in. Down, and then it locks. And it gets held in by these little notches on the back there. I'm just going to prove that the thing still works after I plug it in. So, well it seems to be working. Put this away before I ruin everything. <laughs> I've got a bit of bearer board and I've cut it down to just fit inside the gun without shorting any of the tracks. So everything's got to fit on this, which could be fun. And I'm going to try and use stuff that I've already got. I don't know if you can see this, this is called a DF Player Mini. So it takes a SD card and it can play audio files from those SD cards. You can send it messages via a microcontroller and it produces an audio output which you can then either connect directly to a speaker but it'll probably be very low output or you can feed into an amplifier just fits inside there so we can use this to try it out and then eventually when I actually get my dialer up and running it'll plug it into the proper audio that goes with the voice modulator. Along with that I only seem to have 78 SO5 regulators so I'm gonna have to try and jam one of those on there somehow. Hopefully because I'm only running 100 odd milliamps for a few seconds I shouldn't have to heat sink this. I also seem to only own one MOSFET IRF 520. Thankfully it's an end channel MOSFET whose gate's threshold voltage is less than 5 volts so I should be able to switch this on and off with a microcontroller. I'm going to try and make use of these. These are some PIC microcontrollers I've got lying around. This is a 16F1936. I haven't done any PIC micro stuff for about 5 years so it's going to be a bit of a challenge trying to remember everything. I'm going to use this on several other things. I've got another one of these. Maybe we should make up like a little development board. A bit old and janky now, but this is a FTDI USB to UART 3.3 volt serial adapter. So maybe I could put a connector on the end of this, make up a little bearer board test module with one of these on it, and maybe hook up one of those speakers or something. Just try and see if I can do some development by sending messages to it from my PC using a terminal emulator. If we can get to that stage, figure out how this thing works, prove that it works. Then we can look at trying to integrate it with a microcontroller. I think that's a good place to start. So I've got my little off-cut of Vera board. I'm going to knock up a little development kit on there. And I've got a few of these that all sound player modules. So I'm trying to fix one of those onto there. But before I do that, let's try and do something with this janky cable. Ideally I'll put a six-way connector on there, but it looks like I don't actually have any. So for the short term, I'm going to put three of these little two-way Molexes side by side. It's amazing. I've got absolutely shit loads of stuff, but it's amazing how many components you need to be able to do anything. I've just been on the um, data sheet and this is the wiring list. So it's got the colour code and then what the signals are. And then uh, these are the actual wires, so I'll just put the crimp pins on the end of these. And then I'll make the equivalent of a six way connector by breaking that up into one, two, three, four, five, six. Sit that on there and then get it to just bite down one click so it holds it in place. The outer one's gripped on the installation and the inner one's gripped onto the actual copper itself. So I'm black and brown together black on pin one. Push it in. You can just about get them to line up like that. So I'm hoping this is all we need to be able to try it out. So this is a six-way connector for the RSD32 cable that we just made up. This is the um, little DF player jobby. That's about as simple as I can make it. And on the application notes they do actually have a couple of little um, switches connected to these pins but I'm hoping I can avoid using them really. If we're just sending messages over serial, then maybe we don't need this bit. If I put it on this board, I'll leave up quite a bit of space. So if I need to revise this later, or add any more components or anything like that, I've got, still got a bit of room for it. This is the kind of alignment we want. So looking at the drawer, we've got VCC going from pin 3 to pin 1, TX going to pin 2, RX to pin 3, Pins 1, 2 and 3 line up with pins 3, 4 and 5 there, so I've kind of lined them up. RTS isn't going to get used, TTS isn't going to get used, and obviously I have to wire in ground. I don't have a bloody track breaker, do I? Of course I don't, so I just have to do a scalp, which is a bit of a pain in the arse, but I'll just score these quickly. 
you have scored it. You can actually get a scout wander and just pop the, the copper trace off. Mm. Find a bit of damage there, yeah, but might not matter. I'm very out of practice with this stuff, so I'm much more clumsy than I used to be when it comes to making PCBs. Do you know what I should have done actually? I should quickly give this a quick whiz with some sandpaper. Yeah, so they're on the one. That's fine though. You can just press down on the tab without touching the pin. Heat the pin up and push it flat. Yeah, so that one's down flat now, I just need to sort the other two out. Just heat that up. And then once they're flat, you can solder the other pins. And then these might not be the best joints, you can just reflow them. That's the first soldering I've done for about three years. So pin one is this one up in the top corner here. Grab a cap. I could leave that top trace at zero volts and then just drop down to those two pins. So, looking at that, VCC is pin one, ground is pin one there. We know pin one of three, so that should just be able to bridge across three and one. And we want that as close as possible, probably, to the actual board itself. So, I think we want that in there, don't we? Good way of doing it is just pin it in like that. VCC down to seven. seven. Going to be slightly oversized just so it holds itself in. Oh goody, so I need a new tip for this iron. So just added on some extra little jumpers and then this five-way connector, which is going to be the speaker output at the bottom. One thing I was struggling with is uh, I was really finding it difficult to solder and I even managed to burn off one of the traces and I was like, what the hell's going on? I'm burning the flux. And something's happened to my tip, I think. It's just overheating. Look at how black that is. It's just getting way too hot. So I think I'm gonna need a new tip for my soldering iron. Never mind. Okay, so I've got that five-way connector. So I'm gonna make a one-to-one -one map into this Molex connector. So I'm just gonna wire in zero volts and then two wires for the left and right. Huh, I don't have any yellow multi-core wire, unfortunately, so I'm gonna have to go with blue and orange. So what I'll do is I'll solder them into those pins. I'll leave the other two for the moment. Heat shrink over them, and then I'll twist those together and stick the Molex crimp pins on the end. Looks about right. You basically want like a millimetre sticking out when you poke it all the way in. So yeah, I've burnt that insulation slightly. Now it's going blue again, so now it's overheating. Insulation's instantly burning. See that the flux is all burnt straight off the bat before it's even been able to flow over the metal. Oh, this is going to make everything hard work. A little ball pin free. That car goes to yellow, but in this instance it's going to be orange, so I'll put the orange one in there. Alright, next colour is blue. These are awful, really. Massive overspills of solder because its flux is like gone before it's, before it's even made it onto the onto the part, the solder is heating the flux up so much it's just burning and it's not flowing anywhere so uh, well it seems solid oh that looks like the one, I'm good with that one
Twist the ends. this connector to go to our jack cable. So what I'm gonna to have to do is lock the end of one of these off, I think. So, chop. Just gently cutting into it. <sighs> wow. Look at how fine those wires are. I wonder if that's like um, enamel like you get on magnet wire. I wonder if you could just burn it off with a soldering iron by tinning it. I'm going to have to splice some wires onto that and put a bunch of heat shrink over it to try and strain relief it because that looks so fragile. Can we just do this? Burn the enamel off. Yes we can. That's actually tinned nicely there. This is ground, which I think we already knew. And then we have right and left. Right, so this should be the ground. Ground is red, right. Right is gold, which you mean left is blue. I made left blue. But yeah, that's how I ended up. Found some of this wire well, I use on AC DC adapters, so I'm going to use that for the power supply. go to the positive wire here, which it does. This one should go to negative, which it does. So we should have the ground signal here. That should go to pin five. Yep. Okay, so I think we pretty much got everything we need to do our test of this board. We've got a little test board. So we've got our little board. We've got our five-way connector there, which will be the audio output. And we got our pseudo six-way connector there, which is gonna represent both power to the board and our serial comms. So we should be able to start doing some development work from now. Right, so next day, I've got the RS232 USB adapter plugged in. I've just measured it and it, we're getting 3.3 volts out there. I'd actually plugged it on and checked that we didn't get any shorts on the board, so they're all good. This is like a really small amplifier module. It's got a couple of little speakers. And then what we need to do is I need to get this micro SD card and I'm gonna load the gun sound effect on there and then see if that works. Right, so we've got the memory card in. Um, double check, the format it accepts is FAT16 or FAT32. So this one is FAT32, so it should be all good. Um, I've just ripped this audio um, track for a dialect gun that I'm gonna use. This is it. So I've um, ripped that from this video here. Doctor Who dialect death ray and Cyberman gun sound effect by that SFX guy. Also actually asked if you minded whether I actually rip it, so yeah, real good. Apparently this will play MP3s, so I'm gonna copy that on there. So if you look at the actual manual, it says it supports MP3 and WMV decoding, so I'll put uh, an MP3 file on there rather than a WAV file. Um, but I did see somewhere that it said something about the file name being like 
101 or something like that. Yeah, there we go. For example, specify all one folder, 100 MP3 file. The file names are 0, 0, 01 to 99. So just for argument's sake, I might name it 01.mp3 anyway. So copy that over to 01. And it's going to be in the root directory. All right, so let's try and pop this in. Now, this is one of those little devices where it uh, push it into release and push it into lock. So hope to God I don't blow this up. Let's put the power back on by reconnecting this connector. So we should be good to go. So I've got the FTDI USB cable plugged in. It's come up as COM4 in a device manager. So we can use that for our serial comms. I was trying to see if we could get something out of it on PuTTY, which is a terminal emulator. But it looks like this document's a bit rubbish, the manual for this, and it doesn't seem to have a complete specification for what the actual serial comms are sent over. So we've got the board rate, board rate, whatever it is. It says data bits one. That seems a little unlikely, so I'm guessing it's data bits eight, stop bits one, but it could be. Well, it doesn't even specify for parity, so it could be a stop bits one, maybe. Ah, so we did get something. Mm, it's going to be a bit of a pain in the ass. Okay, we'll try writing our own. Uh, see if I can write my own little serial program. I've done this for bloody years, so it'd be interesting to know if I can even remember how to do it. Probably the quickest way to get something working is probably to do it in C sharp, I suspect. I've done that for a while. Let's give that a go. Try writing some a little console application in C sharp. See if that works. Right, so this is like the first C sharp program I've written in bloody years, based on some stuff on Google because I haven't done this for ages. I've written probably the most basic C sharp program just to try and receive any data we're receiving over the serial port and display it on the screen. So the program's running, it's just sitting in a loop, and any bytes it receives over the COM port is going to display on the screen. And I've also made it say, based on the data sheet, it says that every terminating byte is characters EF. So I've said that if it receives an EF, just add a new line in there. If I just plug this in, Come on, there we go. So it's pumped those bytes out onto the serial port. I'll lift that off again so it's not connected and then connect it again. It's just added it in as a new line so we can do that multiple times. So it looks like that's the message it sends out to say that it's alive. So now we can have a go at writing a message to it to see if it will actually play a song, which is all we really need to do for the time being. Look for the manual and it actually gives you exactly what statement to write as a series of bytes to play the first song. We've obviously only got one song on here. So I've just created a, an array of bytes with those values in it. And I'm hoping I can just send that to the serial port and with a bit of luck, it will play our track. Plug this in. So we should have power onto our audio module now. We could try running this and see if it actually plays the sound effect. I'm going to plug this device in. Now the static from the speakers has stopped. We've got our message received. So is it going to play if I hit a key? No. <laughs> Never mind. Okay, what happened there then? I might have buggered up the file name, so just a quick thing to try. I've, I've renamed 01.mp3 to 001.mp3 and I've created an 01 folder and copied it into that 01 folder. Nada. Hmm. I think I'm going to have to do some debugging. I might have to whip the scope out and see what the hell's going on there. Okay, so I modified the program slightly so that it checks. If you hit the space bar, it's going to send that data stream out to the device. Hit the enter key, it will exit. So I'll notice if I press the space bar now, we're actually getting a response back from the DF player. So let's try and decode what the hell it's actually trying to tell us. Well, actually, look, our first statement we got back was 70FF063F002, uh, and then the two checks some data values, and then the F. So that was saying that our memory cards worked. And then what we're getting here, we're getting 70FF6040. So there's 603 something. We've got a four on the error code, it's not zero, 01 or two. It feels like it should be an error code like that, but I'm not sure exactly what we, what we are getting. All right, figured it out. Ridiculous problem. So the example code they give you in here to play the first track, this one here, the bloody checksum's wrong. I was trying to figure it out. And I thought, okay, well maybe I've got to try and calculate this myself. So this was the original series of bytes. What I did was I created this checksum variable and it wasn't coming up with FFE6 because you're supposed to do not the start byte or the end byte, but the bytes between them, not including the checksum. Sum them together, take them from zero, and you get the two hex bytes. So I just for the curiosity's sake, I thought I'd just actually punch those two numbers in, and guess what happens when I actually run it? 
bloody works. Unbelievable. Their own sodding document is wrong. So it actually works. Oh, I've just wasted half an hour for nothing. Good news. I don't know if I can run this for more than one. Did it restart. So that's why it was coming back with the error code. It does tell us when it's finished. Run it. It comes back with a message to tell us it's complete. Anyway, for the time being, because we're only running one file that I could get away just for the sake of doing this gun thing of writing our pick program, literally just to send that series of data and then I think for later usage of this, we have to go through and write a proper driver set for it. But yeah, what a bloody pain in the ass. That is so loud. That is so loud. It's quite fun though. Right, so I've spent half an hour trying to knock something up. I didn't really want to spend too long on it, so I've kind of made up some of the values a little bit. So we're going to use the PIC16F 1936 as our microcontroller. Basically, all it's going to do is keep an eye on the push button. So I've got a little push button which is going to go on the connector. And whenever you press the button, it's going to send the message out to the DF player to play the audio. And for the same time that it's playing the audio, it's also going to send... Uh, this signal high to um, switch on the MOSFET, which will then connect power across the laser module. So the laser module will be energized for the time that that sound is going. Well, roughly the same time, or maybe it might make it slightly different. Well, we've got a connector here, which is this connector, our five-way connector. Goes to this round connector here. Uh, so that's gonna supply our 12 volt power for the board because our dialect's gonna run as a 12 volt system. And then we've also got the audio output, which uh, hopefully is not an issue with um, sort of interference, we'll give that a go. We've got a five volt regulator, which is gonna derive the five volts from the 12 volt supply, and hopefully supply the five volts we need, not only for the board, but also for the laser. Power dissipation isn't gonna be a problem, or heat dissipation isn't gonna be a problem, because this is like a two amp rated regulator, and hopefully it's only gonna be drawing 100 milliamps for a matter of like two and a half seconds. That's the ICSP, or in-circuit serial programming connector, which we're gonna to need to actually program the PIC, because we really wanna debug it and program it in situ, ideally. So the idea with this is, this is supposed to be like a minimum, least viable product. I'll get this to work, go and have a play around with it, and then we'll devise like a proper version two. Maybe I'll spend some proper time on it and actually make a PCB. And then you could also have a few other optional extras, like for example, at the moment there's no attenuation of the audio. But it just happens that I'm okay with the volume of that. But if you're plumbing it into your audio output for like your voice modulator or something, it could be way too loud or it could be way too quiet. Yeah. So we'll give this a go. I'll see if I can knock this up in a few hours and then try this out either today or tomorrow. And then I can move on to doing some of the million other things I've got on my list. <laughs>
see if my old uh, pit kit 3 still works. This thing's bloody donkey's years old. I haven't used it for about four years, five years, so interesting to know if it even works. But fingers crossed. Let's get this connected up so that's slotting into the header. I've got that little bit of extra length on there for some clearance. Okay, we've got our little switch. And so we'll go at uh, opening this up in MP Lab and see if we can get something working. On power up, we need to have some sort of setup tool to set up the ports and everything like that. We then need to wait some certain amount of time after it's powered up. Obviously, by the time you've plugged it on, it isn't going to be where we're actually using the gun. So we could wait 250, so maybe a quarter of a second. That might be bad. So now we've got our main loop. So once we're into our main program loop, we're going to wait until the button is pressed. Probably we want the laser to go on marginally after we send the message to play the audio file, don't we? Play audio file. Turn on laser. We're doing a least minimal viable product and I know for a fact that I made the file exactly 2.5 seconds. So we could say, uh, I reckon if we do wait I reckon it should be slightly less than 2.5 seconds. It'd be good if the sound light like, hung around a little bit after the light's gone off. 2.2 seconds. Off laser. Then what we want to do is make sure that the button isn't still held in. Wait until button released. So we want to make sure that I can't just hold the button in and it keeps firing, fire, fire, fire. I want to have to actually press it every time. And I think that's it, isn't it? pretty much. That's the whole logic there. I think for the absolute simplest possible program, that's probably going to do the job, isn't it? Right, so what do we need to do? Let's make sure we get this set up right first then. Oh, i trying to remember all this stuff. Set configuration bits. There we go. Right, for the oscillator, we want internal oscillator. Right, do we want the watchdog? No, we don't want We'll keep everything simple. Oh, do we want a power up timer? Maybe, actually. I don't think, don't think it does any harm. We're only using that for the programmer, so we've got it held high, so yeah, we'll keep that on. Code protection, no, we don't care about that. Okay, generate source code output. These must be the two config bits. Hopefully that will enable the oscillator. So, I can't really remember half this stuff. Right, so we have to define our external our crystal frequency for it to be able to calculate that. So let's have a look. We've got our internal oscillator. Oh, it's 16 megahertz, is it? Uh, okay, so we need to specify something to tell it to go into the right mode. So we want to create a delay, so we want delay milliseconds as our function call. Delay milliseconds 250. The OSCON register is set to 0111 and the frequency selection is set to 500 kilohertz. So we need to change that after, immediately after reset. Yeah, we want to set that value to all ones for those bits. In, oh, okay, so we want OSCON bits dot the IRCF equals to what, four bits, so it's going to be an F, isn't it? CS equals, and it doesn't matter whatever the least significant bit is, so we can do X to I think probably the best thing to try and do, just for now, is um, you just want a really simple um, high and low loop, don't we? One second or something like that. No. This will be how we can confirm our uh, oscillator is working, isn't it? So what do we need to do then? We need to configure RC3 as an output, don't we? We should just be able to set the tri-state register of port C. 1, C is an input. 0, C is an output. Right, okay. The C, 1, 1, 1. Set that low. Okay, let's see where we're at then. Save this, let's see if it actually builds and see how close we are to actually getting something to run. Make and program main device. Right, is it actually running? There's a question. 
So it looks like we're getting, if I measure between 0 volts and the gate, well pin 14, which is RC3, we get 5, 0, 5, 0, 5, 0. So once every second it's changing. I'm going to grab the laser goggles, because this will be a useful thing to try out. Is this able to power the laser module and fire it? There we go, on, on, off. On, off. Wait a minute. The output shouldn't even be on. That's being powered by the Pit Kit 3, isn't it? Uh, on. Yeah, there we go. Pit Kit 3 was powering that. That seems to be working okay. Okay, right, so we know that oscillator is working then. What else do we need to do? We need to configure our button, which is RB0, as an input. So if we say analog select B, zero for digital output. And actually, uh, is I hate writing code like this. I normally write self documenting code, but I'm going to use comments. I hate writing comments. FF all pins in for B to input. So what we could do, we could make the state of the output for the laser mirror the state of the switch. Port C bits equals and maybe we can make this port b bit dot rb0 so if that works we should just be able to press the button and the laser will come on so i just realized it's the opposite isn't it i should invert the state of rb0 but i can press the button and it actually turns the laser off it's because this is um pulling it low rather than high it's very responsive Okay, so I think actually that means that all the inputs and outputs on the pick are working. So that all we have to really focus then on is sorting the audio driver out. So we're going to implement in everything except for playing the audio file. So when the button is pressed, it goes low. So we want to say, while well, RB0, well that's going to be 1, isn't it, when it's high. But while it's high, delay seconds 5. So it's just going to sit there and block until that is no longer high. Wow. Not port B R B zero. Delay in a second. Right. So let's re-implement those right now. Turn on laser. It's just that. Turn off laser. It's that. Hopefully we can test that out pretty easily. Program onto the device. Sorry, I don't want that. Take that. Right. So not on. Press the trigger, get one, two, and off, and one, two, and off. And if I press it during that two seconds, it doesn't make any difference. I can fire it again. Like I could leave that on, it goes off, and it doesn't come back on until I release it and press it again. <laughs> this is all a bit too easy, this. Now for the serial port stuff, then. So the last thing you need to do then is we need to implement sending our string of characters over the serial port. Um, configure UART. If I open that old program that I wrote, the C sharp one. So this is the configuration data for our serial port. And then we've actually got our string that we're sending over the serial port, which is this array of bytes here, isn't it? I guess we can make that a const. Char is an array. Hey, what? Let's make that static const. Okay, so what we want to do is we effectively want to iterate over our size of our array and write it to the serial port, don't we? Uh, you know what? Hash include standard int dot h. Actually, I don't want to u in eight t. Do I want size t? Size less than size of play song message so we want to send character i from play song message i send by i from play song message to the uart tx port don't have a clue how to do that yet but we're going to figure it out i think we just copy that to a tx register the transmission is initiated by writing a character to the tx register the TSR it still contains all 
or part of the previous character, the new character data is held in the TX register until stop bit of the previous character. Okay, so we need to do some sort of wait. So we're going to say TX reg is equal to play song message I. Right, okay, so we need to pull this TMR bit and say while it's low, we have to wait. TX STA bits dot TMT. So we should say while this is low, do nothing until this register goes high. So the last thing then we need to do is configure our UART port. So, so let's go back to the data sheet. So enabling the transmitter, the USAR transmitter is enabled for asynchronous operations by configuring the following three control bits. TX enable bit enables the transmitter. TX enable equals one. Let's enable the RC SDA rated register enables the USAR and automatically configures the TX clock IO pin as an output. Clearing the sync bit of the SDA register could yeah, okay, right, there we go. So it's that. Each character transmission consists of one start bit followed by eight or nine data bits and is always terminated by one or more stop bits. We want eight data bits, one stop bit, no parity. Now let's set some of these bits then. So TX9 is equal to zero. Equals zero. Oh, it's giving us the data there. It's actually giving us the numbers. Ah, oh, maybe that's what I got wrong then. Well, I just copied that wrong. Let's try this then. It's 25. That's the value. 8 bit. It's 25, not bloody 9615. You just don't know how to read. Right, so we're going to bin this. Let's see if this works now. How many times can I screw this up? That's the question. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Right, there we go. Let's get the laser goggles on. Let's see how this lines up with the sound. I'll plug the laser module in. And three, two, one. That's pretty good. I think we're done. We have a working solution. Ah, oh, right now I just need to try and package it up and get it into the um, get it into the gun then. Just quickly, just want to prove that without the pick kit free on it, it works. Uh, so we're going to put on and right. Let's see if I can just tape some of this down. Try and insulate it like that. Okay, let's see if it works like this. This is the moment of real truth, isn't it? So, not sure it, which is a good start. So, does it fire? Yes, it does. Cool, time to go and test the thing out then. Right, I've got a power pack for that, and I've kind of tied all this lot together. So, uh, I think hopefully we're in a position where we're, we're a bit more mobile. So let's go out and shoot some lasers. <laughs> we're going to go shoot some lasers. <laughs> First time, test fire. Three, two, one. That's pretty cool, actually. Oh. Can it? See the beam in this. Like. Shoot that box thing. Thank <laughs> you. 
Just wanted to make a quick disclaimer. Obviously, that laser isn't anything I would take out into public. It's just something I'm playing around with for the sake of YouTube. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for watching. Um, I'll do a revision of this design, which doesn't use a laser. Probably uses LEDs and might have a PCB and stuff. But I'll come back to that in a future video. But otherwise, thanks very much for watching. Take it easy.